welcome to Followers Worship Online. We're glad you could join us. Many new Christians have heard about God's grace and wondered about the very specific meaning. It's pretty easy to find the pat answer. It's usually something like undeserved favor. But the more we learn about grace and its counterpart, mercy, the more complex we find it to be. Rick says, gaining God's approval is not a do-it-yourself project. We can never earn it, no matter how much good we do. We're pardoned from sin and promised eternal life only because of the undeserved love and mercy of Jesus. So our salvation depends on a supernatural element, not a superhuman effort. Just keep the faith and keep your focus. Scripture, hymnals, and the portfolios of Christian bands around the world are chock full of grace. We're going to explore a few of those things today.
There's future grace that's mine today That Jesus Christ has won So I can face tomorrow
So how do we respond to the grace of God? The little book of Titus has some compelling advice, if we'll just listen. We'll be reading selected verses from Titus 2 and 3. The grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. So turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. Live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. So submit to the government be obedient, and always be ready to do what is good. Don't slander anyone, and avoid quarreling. Instead, be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Once we, too, were foolish and disobedient, but when God, our Savior, showed His kindness and love, He saved us, not because of the good things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new life through the Holy Spirit. Because of His grace, he made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. So all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in me this morning. Child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Yes. 
Today we come before you in a selfish state. Our focus is so often me-centered. We think mostly of how we'll survive this crazy world. We zero in on thinking about chores and responsibilities, what we'll eat, when we have to work, our relationships and our future. We think of food and fuel prices and we worry far too much about tomorrow. We confess we are not good about thinking of others, and we're often even less successful in reaching out to others to help them. Lord, make us more aware of those who don't have the benefits that we do. Help us first think of those people and then move to help them. We know that we can bless people in hunger, war, and disaster with money, but we know you've also put people around us in this city who are in need. Help us to open our eyes to see those we can help and make us your ambassadors here and around the world. Keep us from useless arguments and help your love radiate from within our church. Amen. When I was a little boy, my mother's birthday rolled around. It was May 22nd, and if you've been at Followers for any length of time, you will remember my mother, Alice. I wanted to get her something for her birthday, and so I did what all little kids do. I went to my dad and said, I kind of need some money. And I remember way back, and we're talking many, many years ago, more than I care to record, 
But back then, $20 was a lot of money. It just so happened that my father only had a 20. So he gave me the bill and he said to me, and I'll never forget the tone in which this was delivered. You can spend $5 and I want the change. Well, it just so happened we were living on William Street and there was a jeweler's just about three blocks away on Brant Ave, Robel's Jewelers. So I walked over there and I put that poor jeweler through I don't know how much because I made him show me everything in that entire store that was worth $5. And I didn't see anything that I wanted. This was really important to me because my mom was so special. But there was this heart. It was glittering. It was captivating. I was absolutely entranced because I'd never seen anything like it anywhere before. And I hemmed and I hawed because it was $10. And I knew what my father said. I knew how he was going to react if I bought the heart. But I did. And I don't know if you can tell from where you're sitting or not, but under the light, you can really understand why this was something I had to have for her. And I didn't need it for me. I didn't want it for me, but I didn't want it for her. And so I kind of gulped and I paid the price and I went home and she was thrilled to death. My father, not so much. <laughs> and I remember having the conversation. He was not happy, but I think he understood why I had done what I had done. And he cut me some slack. And years later, I would learn a lesson from that whole encounter because it seems to me that that's exactly what God does with us. We sometimes have this tendency to think that God is all about the rules, that it's all about whether we stay in line or whether we step out of line. And I think there are a lot of people who think that God spends all his time just waiting for us to mess up so he can zap us back into where we need to be. That encounter with my own dad, as imperfect as he was, showed me that even we as human beings can look at the intent of the heart and we can cut each other some slack when we understand what motivates us to do what we do. In the same way, God looks at us and he understands sometimes we mess up quite deliberately and other times there are other things going on in our hearts and he's able to understand all that. But the biggest lesson is that even when we are willful, even when we are rebellious and unloving, God gives us grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. The Apostle Peter is writing in his first epistle, and he says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And let's remember that it cost him everything. Sometimes we take liberties with that. But he loves us anyway, passionately and completely. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the love which caused you to send your son to this earth to see him tortured and humiliated for our gain. And we recognize, Lord, it's only because of his sacrifice and nothing that we can offer that we're able to stand before you with boldness and confidence, knowing that we have right standing with you. And we pray that as we take a few moments here to remember where we are in our walk with you and where it is that we want to be, that you would bless us with wisdom and clarity, and more than that, with love and gratitude that will make us more into the image of your Son in the days ahead. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us far beyond a $10 heart. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen.
so many of us from giving to needy people. We tend to blame them for their own situations. They probably spent all their money on cigarettes, alcohol, lottery tickets, and junk food. So our giving reminder is important this week, especially for me. Charity sees the need and not the cause. 
When God urges you to give, don't argue about why you shouldn't. As we talk further about grace, I want to leave you with this beautiful blessing that's really resonated with me this week. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. That's from John 1, 16. God's grace is available in abundant, overflowing measure. Be blessed with it this week. And now here's Rick's third lesson in Philippians about grace, focus, and effort called supernatural versus superhuman. Have a great week. Grace is nothing new to you. You know all about grace if you've been in the church for any length of time. But I want to give you a handle that you can use today to carry this sermon home with you. It's very simple and very easy to remember. God gives you grace for your past. God gives you grace for your present. And God gives you grace for your future. And that's all contained in Philippians chapter 3. And we are going to get there, but first I want to tell you a story that I think helps to understand what grace is. Now, I just want to warn you that a lot of times preachers end up telling stories that often end up to be false or fabricated. And so one of the things I've taken to do in recent years is to check out all the stories that I use to make sure that I'm not passing on something that isn't true and accurate. So some of you may have heard this story. Some of you will not have. But I checked it out on Snopes, which is a world-class fact-checking organization, and it says that this story has not been confirmed, but it's plausible. I like to believe it's true, and I think you'll hope that it's true when you hear the story too. Now, you've probably heard of LaGuardia Airport in New York City, and maybe you even know that that was named after Fiorello LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York City during the Great Depression and all through World War II. He was quite a colorful character. He was popular. He was absolutely beloved by his people. They called him the Little Flower because he was five foot four and he always wore a carnation in his lapel. He was a little bit different than your conventional politician. As a matter of fact, LaGuardia would often go on the fire trucks with the firefighters or he would join the police when they raided a speakeasy. And sometimes he would take an entire orphanage to a New York Yankees game. That's the kind of hands-on guy that he was. And so it wasn't a big surprise to people who knew him when one night in January 1935, LaGuardia walked into a courtroom. He dismissed the judge who was there and said, you can go home because I'm gonna take over today. And under New York state law, that was entirely permissible for him to do. So he sits at the bench, and one of the first cases to come before him is a woman, an older woman. And it turns out she's been charged with theft. She stole a loaf of bread. And the shop owner said, I need to press these charges because it's a bad neighborhood, Your Honor, and if we don't do something about this, the problem will just continue. And so the story unfolds, and the judge hears that this woman is the sole supporter of two grandchildren. There's no money in the household, and the kids are starving, literally starving, and so she stole a loaf of bread to feed the children. Down comes the gavel. LaGuardia says, guilty as charged, and I'm going to fine you $10, because I can make no exceptions for the law. And as he says those words, he reaches into his wallet, he takes out his own $10, and he says to the woman, your penalty is paid in full. And more than that, I'm gonna find everybody in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a city where a woman has to steal to feed her children. And they pass a hat, and a short time later, they hand this woman $47.50 because there were a lot of people in that court that day. Just imagine, $47.50. Do you see the point here? LaGuardia said he could not make an exception for the law. But he paid the penalty for her, and that precisely is what God does for us. God cannot wink at sin. He cannot pretend that it doesn't matter. His sense of justice demands that something needs to be done about our sin and our rebellion. 
But instead of acting out of anger and harsh heartedness, he pays the penalty for us by sending his son to the cross to die for our sins. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what grace is all about. And you know what? Even if that story never happened, we do know that something very, very similar did happen to Billy Graham. At the height of his popularity, he was driving in the United States one day and he got pulled over by the cops for speeding. He has to appear before a magistrate. The magistrate recognizes him right away. He hears the facts of the case. He says, Mr. Graham, I know who you are, but the law is no respecter of persons. I'm fining you $10, $1 for every mile that you were over the limit. And again, this judge reaches out and he takes his own money and he pays the fine. And later that night, he had arranged to meet with Billy Graham and the judge treated the minister to a lavish steak dinner. When recounting this story sometime later, Graham said, that, that is exactly what God does for a penitent sinner. Do you see the point? God loves us so much that he wants to pay the price that must be exacted for what we do to contravene his rules and his laws. But he does this with love and tenderness and mercy. And that's why we can never pretend to earn the favor of God. There's just nothing we can do to deserve that or to earn it. And he wants us to understand that to the depth of our being. Paul is really centered on that theme in Philippians 3. He says, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I have confidence in my own effort, if I'm gonna compare myself to everybody else, he says, look, if you're looking for credentials, I've got that. He goes on to explain that he was a Jew's Jew. He was circumcised when he was eight days old. He was a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, he says, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if ever there was one, he said. And he even thought he was doing God a favor by persecuting Christians because he was zealous for the Lord. But he understands to the core of his being at this point that that's not going to cut it, that there is nothing that he can do to earn God's right standing. He says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Jesus. For God's way of making us right with him depends on faith. And I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Do you see what he's saying there? We have grace in the present because God reaches down and he looks past our sin. He sees the potential and the promise that is in every one of us and that is his focus. Not this desire that some people think God focuses on where he just wants to zap us back into line every time we step out of line. Just imagine how that skews your concept of God in your own life. If you think that all God is interested in is judgment and harsh penalties. Because let me tell you, the people out there and the people in here already have enough of that. You have plenty of people in your life who are ready to judge you now. They're going to compare you. They're going to assess you. They're going to evaluate you. And they're going to use criterion, criteria that you don't want them to use. Now, we're either going to buy into that mentality or we're going to come to understand that the only thing that matters is what God thinks of us. And we're going to have to come to understand that there is nothing we can do to make us deserving of the favor and the love that God lavishly showers upon us. And if we come to that understanding, it is a liberating experience because all of a sudden, you're not going to have to worry about measuring up. You don't have to worry about doing enough, giving enough, praying enough, being enough. Because the reality is you can't be enough to deserve what God wants to give you. All you can do is reach out and accept the gift that God gives you because he loves you and he loves you enough to even give his own son to secure your salvation. Our job then is to do good, 
That's what Titus said. Our job is to do good, but not to get salvation, but because we already have salvation. That's the motivation. It's gratitude. It's not some sense that we've just got to do everything we can to make sure that we're in. You are already in. You are included. You are loved. You are valued. And you are empowered by the grace of God. I didn't understand this for the very first part of my ministry, but grace is not just the undeserved mercy and forgiveness of God. Grace is also the power that comes from God for you to live the life that he wants you to live. In the second chapter in Philippians, as we saw last week, Paul talks about how God gives us the desire and the power to do what he wants us to do. So let me ask you this, in your life right now, when you look at the things that you struggle with, do you just need God to help you get to where you know you need to be, where you want to be? Or do you have to ask God to give you the desire to even go there in the first place? Because as I said last week, there are times when I just don't want to do the right thing. Thank you very much. I don't want to serve. I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to put myself out. I just want to do what I want to do. And sometimes God has to work on our hearts in a powerful, compelling way to make us even want to do the right thing. And then only then can we accept that power that he gives us so that we can change and be transformed into the image of his son. That's not ever going to be quick, and it will seldom be easy for any of us. But that's what we're called to. That's what we're called to. Now, I have a question for you, and it's a very simple one. We've talked a lot even today, about how we just, have to, we just have to accept what God has for us, and that we can't do anything to deserve it or to earn it. All right, well enough. But let me ask you this. What is it that we do in our lives, even though we intellectually know these things, what are some of the things we do to try to earn the favor of God, whether we acknowledge it or don't? Think about that. What do we do? I want you to tell me. Think of others. That's the problem. Sometimes we do think of others, usually when it's convenient or when it is easy, and a lot of times we don't. We don't. And if we don't think about others, we're never going to have that kind of response of gratitude and appreciation that God wants from us. What gets in your way? How do you try to earn the approval of either the people around you or even God himself? What does that look like in your life? Because I think if we don't really understand this, we're going to miss some very important things. I think sometimes we're obedient to God. Right. Yeah. Imagine living your life as a child where you only do the right thing because you're afraid of the consequences. Well, let me tell you, there are lots of kids who live their lives like that because they know what the consequences are and they know what's in store for them if they don't comply. And they don't live out of love. They live out of fear and obligation. So yeah, that's an important consideration. What else? How do we earn the approval of others or how do we circumvent the grace that God wants for us? Because we do all the time. I think you've hit it right on the head. One of the things that we do that gets in the way of God just giving us what he wants to give us and our accepting of it is comparison. We're always looking at other people, and provided we're doing more and we are more than they are, then we feel secure. But if we start looking around and we see that even people in the church have things that we don't have, giftedness or ability, talent, whatever you want to call it, we can even feel envious about that, or we can start to feel insecure. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, I could never pray at the front because I can't pray like so-and-so? Oh, I'd never take a lesson because I can't preach like he does. There are lots of ways in which we get hamstrung by our inability to see that God gives you what he wants to give you, and you have to accept that without comparing yourself to other people, or you never move on to the effective use of whatever it is that God has given you in the first place. So we have to be careful that we're accepting of those things. I think that we have all been raised in this generation to be very friendly. And I think for some people that all starts with what happens in the past. If we're saying, okay, I can see how God could give grace to people who do deserve it or who haven't really done all those things out of malice, 
That's one thing. But I don't think he could forgive me because I was so intentional and so deliberate in my sin. I've had a lot of people in counseling sessions tell me they just can't accept the fact that God could forgive them, not, not after what they've done, why they did it. That's a total misunderstanding of how God operates. It's a failure to comprehend the nature of God himself. Because God knows that so often what we do is entirely willful and deliberate. It's not that we don't know any better, it's just that we do know better and we don't care at the time. Or we don't have the wherewithal spiritually to get past our own selfishness and do what he wants us to do. That's why pride and self-centeredness is the core of every sin I can think of. And the problem is, if you have a history of that, it can be hard for you to move beyond the perception that you're just irredeemable. And in the eyes of God, nobody is beyond redemption. Not ever. Not now and not ever. We don't, he says, rely on human effort. He says, I've discarded all of that. Let me just be frank here. When Paul says everything else is garbage, the New Testament is sanitizing that word. Paul uses the S word. What he's trying to convey is it's all nothing. All his power, his position, his prestige, it's all nothing compared to the love, the mercy, and the grace of God. And that's what we have to comprehend because if we don't feel forgiven, we're never gonna act on that forgiveness. You're never gonna serve the way you need to serve if you're still worried about your own salvation. Unless you take the view that says, well, maybe I just better do more than I can because maybe then I'll earn the approval of God. You can't do it, period. You can't do it. You're forgiven because God wants to forgive you, chooses to forgive you, sends his son so that he will forgive you. All we have to do is accept that gift. That's what it's all about. God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul says, I need to be faithful because I understand and I believe that one day this is all going to come to a climax. It's all going to come to a head and I want to be there when people are raised. So we have to rely on what Jesus has done for us and not what we do on our own. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Are you listening? I focus on this one thing, he says, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. So if you're going to get into the future the way you need to, then you've got to forget the past. And when I say forget the past, I don't mean disregard what you've done. I don't mean to deliberately pretend like nothing happened. I'm saying you cannot let your past hobble and paralyze you and prevent you from doing what God calls you to do now and in the future. But we know that there are lots of things that do that, don't we? What are some of the things from the past that get in the way of living in the present the way we should? Things like what? Shame. Shame. Guilt. Guilt. Hurt. Hurt. You feel unworthy. Feelings of unworthiness. Regret. The list is long. Sorry? Oh, and that's the thing. People are going to remind you of your past every chance they get if they don't have a heart for you. There are lots of people in your life who will hold you back and they will hold you down. Either because they feel threatened or defensive or it just makes them feel better about themselves if they can make you look worse. A wise man once said that you can't gain any ground by throwing dirt at other people but that doesn't stop people from trying. And if we are completely rooted in our past, if we cannot get past where we were, we cannot be where we should be, let alone where we want to be. That's why it is so important to leave your past in the past. I hear people say all the time, I wasted so much time before I came to God and was in the church. Well, you know what? There is absolutely nothing you can do about that. Not a thing. 
You can look back at what you've done and what you were, and you can feel bad about that, but it's not gonna change a thing. And I want you to understand that if you will not allow yourself out of that self-imposed prison, then what you are doing is negating the work of God in your life. I wanna be absolutely clear about that. If you allow yourself to paralyze yourself because of your past, even God can't take you out of that because he won't override your will. You dare not stand in the way of what God wants for you by refusing to forgive yourself. If God can forgive you, you need to forgive you. Because if you can't forgive you, chances are excellent that you're not going to be able to forgive anybody else in your life any more than you can love somebody fully if you don't love yourself. It is absolutely vital that we do that. In 1904, there was a man by the name of William Borden. He graduated from high school that year, and he was an instant millionaire. And more than that, he was an heir to the Borden Dairy fortune. You've heard of Borden's. Well, this man, this young man, graduates from high school, and to reward him, his parents give him a trip around the world. And this is just an astonishing opportunity for him. And so he goes on this trip, and while he's out in these various countries, he begins to see the poverty and the oppression that is everywhere. And he has a heart for Jesus, and he sees that there are so many people that don't know anything about the Lord. And so halfway through the trip, he cables home and he says to his parents, I've decided to give my life to Christ and to the mission field. And when he made that decision, he wrote in his Bible that night two words. No reservation. He had decided that this is what he needed to do and so there would be no hesitation. And sure enough, he finishes the trip, he goes home, he enrolls at Yale, he finishes his studies, and though he turns down two high-paying job opportunities, he goes to Princeton Seminary instead, and he trains to be a minister. So after two years of training to be a pastor, he's ready. He writes two more words in his Bible. He writes, no reserve. And what he meant by that was, he was not willing to hold anything back. He had this grand plan. He had this glimpse of what God wanted for him, and he was not willing to be stinting in what he was doing. He wasn't gonna do things by half-hearted measures. He wasn't gonna be just doing enough. No reserve. He wanted to give God everything, and he did. He decides he's gonna go to China, and so he catches a ship and he stops on the way in Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, he comes down with meningitis. And he's dead within a month. And you say to yourself, what a complete waste. After all that, what a waste. Well, not to God and not to him. Because Borden, before he died, wrote two more words in his Bible. He wrote, no regret. And that, it seems to me, is the formula for us. We need to understand what God wants us to do. We need to have that vision of what he calls us to do and to be. And we need to say to him, no reservation, I'm in. And then once we start to grasp what that means in our lives, we need to be all in. We need to understand that we have to give everything we've got to give and be everything that we have to be and to become. No reserve. And then we do what we need to do, whether it's for a long time or a short time, whether we're successful or we're not successful, it doesn't matter. No regret. If you can live your life with no reservation in your service to God, no reserve left because you're giving everything you've got, and if you have no regret at the end of the day, it seems to me that Paul would be very happy with that. So would Jesus Christ. But you know, that can be a problem because it's so often a case where we get caught up in what's going on all around us and, and we lose sight of what it is that God calls us to in the beginning. 
And that's what Paul goes on to talk about. He says, I have forgotten my past. Here's a man who persecuted the church, but he's able to forgive himself and accept the free gift of God to be called into his presence, to be rewarded for his faith, not punished for his sin. He says, everything else beyond that is garbage in comparison. But notice what he goes on to say. He says, I don't mean that I've achieved the things that I want or that I've already reached perfection. And by the way, in the New Testament, the word perfection almost always means maturity or completeness. So he's saying, I've got a long way to go, and I understand that. But I press on to possess the perfection or the maturity for which God, through Christ, first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I forget the past, look forward to what's ahead. Yeah. That's the goal, that's the idea. But then he says, but we must hold on to the progress we've already made. And if you're here today and you look at your life and where you are and you just can't see any possibility of making real strong spiritual progress, then do this. Do this for now. Hold on to the progress that you've already made. Because if you compare yourself to where you were sometime back, you'll see that you've made progress. Sometimes that has to be enough until we have the wherewithal to continue with the mission that God wants. And then Paul goes on to say, there are some who live as enemies of the cross. And you would think that he would be angry about that, because that's what I see in the church all the time. People look at what's going on out there and they're just angry. Christians are, are just furious at the world. But listen to this. He says, their God, their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about the things here on earth. Don't we say those things all the time? Oh, look at those despicable people out there. But we, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. What I find significant is what he doesn't say until the early part. He says, I have told you before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they really are enemies of the cross. Paul's not just angry, I think he's hurt, he's grieved. And I would submit that if we spend less time venting our spleens at the people out there that we don't approve of, and have instead a heart for the things that God has a heart for, if we learn to mourn over the things that cause God to grieve, if we have sympathy and we have some understanding for the people out there who've lost their way, or even act in deliberate disobedience, then we in the church will be a much more powerful powerful influence. But it all begins with this idea that we don't belong here. You know, years ago, there was a famous rabbi in Poland, and people used to come from all over the world to see him. And one day, an American comes in. He's a relatively young man. He sees the rabbi in his home. And the young man is astonished because there's this house which has only a table and a chair, book upon book upon book, and a bed. That's it. So the young man says to the rabbi, Rabbi, where's all your furniture? And without missing a beat, the rabbi says to the man, where's yours? The visitor protests, but, but I'm just a visitor. And the rabbi smiled and said, so am I. Do you see what he was saying? This world was not his home. He's passing through, as the old hymn said. And that's the way we need to treat things too, because if we get too comfortable and we get too complacent about where we are and what we have and what we're doing, then we will never be able to live the kind of life that God calls us to live. You cannot have those two mindsets at the same time. We're either here for everything we can have and all that we can get, or we're gonna have our focus elsewhere and that will determine our values, our priorities, and our conduct. Those are the only two choices we have. We need to be those who are citizens of heaven, where Jesus lives, who are eagerly awaiting his return. That's what we're called to be. That's what we're called to do. So let me conclude with one more thing. 
When Christopher Columbus died in Spain in 1506, he was hailed as a hero. After all, look at what he had accomplished. He had broadened the horizons of everyone. He had opened the eyes of the world to what was there. And it's interesting because if you look at the tomb of Christopher Columbus, there is a statue of a lion. And under the lion's paw is the motto that Spain used for a very long time before Christopher Columbus was on the scene. The Spanish motto in Latin was, no more beyond. Because in their arrogance, that's what the Spaniards thought. They thought they had discovered everything there was to discover. And then when Christopher Columbus comes along and he finds all of these new places and the new world, the perceptions are radically altered. And so the lion is portrayed on the statue, scratching out the word no. So what's left? More beyond. Jesus Christ scratches out the word sin, obliterates the word death, and what is left? More beyond. You can't see it. You can't sense it yet, but there's more beyond, and that needs to dictate the way we live our lives every single day, and if we will allow that to happen, then we will glorify God and we will serve the people around us. King Ferdinand financed all of those expeditions that Columbus made. And if we will bow to the authority and the magnificence of our king, and he will support everything that you do and everything that you become. And our lives will not show no more beyond, but they will demonstrate more beyond. May God bless you this week as you try to make that a reality. That's true.